Jesus versus Serapis. Why are we here? Now, as you can see from this meme, it's apparently an idea that's out there. And surprisingly, a lot of people believe that Christianity existed before Jesus and that Christians worshipped Serapis, the Greek god Serapis. And then at the Council of Nicaea, uh, Constantine and I guess the white man or whoever else created Jesus, created the persona of Jesus Christ. And then Christians started worshiping Jesus then. Um, I'm, I'm surprised at the number of people who actually believe this, uh, simply because it's one of the most ridiculous things I've ever heard. And the reason why I say that is it is probably the easy, the most easiest debunkable thing I've ever heard about Christianity or the Council of Nicaea. Um, now, if you've watched my video that I made about the Council of Nicaea, you'll see that I dealt directly, well, I dealt indirectly with this topic because all I did was I went over the Council of Nicaea and what it was really about. And if you watch the video, you'll see that reading the documents from the Council of Nicaea, it had nothing to do with Serapis and the idea that Jesus Christ was created is just silly. Anyone who's ever looked at any documents from the Council of Nicaea or any documents leading up to the Council of Nicaea, meaning the, the letters written by Constantine and Arius and Athanasius, various church leaders writing letters to each other, dealing with uh, the controversy that led to the Council of Nicaea, which was Arianism. Anyone can tell you that the idea of it being evolved around Serapis or creating Jesus as in he didn't exist or the people didn't know about him, they can tell you that the idea is laughable. But anyway, so what we're gonna what I'm gonna do is since I started with the Council of Nicaea, I'm gonna work my way backwards chronologically. And I'm gonna prove to you that Jesus, that, that Christianity was always centered around Jesus. It didn't exist before Jesus. It was centered around Jesus, and at no point in time in history did Christians ever worship Serapis. And the way that I'm going to do that is, I'm going to, uh, I'm going, we're going to look at documents that were written uh, by various people and how they describe Christianity. We're going to look at writings from church fathers. We're going to look at writings from uh, Christ. Well, it's the same thing. Christian leaders. We're going to look at writings from Roman, you know, uh, leadership or government. And we're going to look at documents from haters of Christianity, people that criticize Christianity. And what we're going to do is we're going to go through these documents, read the descriptions of Christianity in, in terms of how it was practiced during that time. And I'll let you decide for yourself if it sounds like it describes uh, a group, a religious group that's worshiping a Greek God or a religious group that's worshiping something totally different, mainly Jesus Christ. So with this being the first video of the series, we're going to start with Lacantius. And the reason why I'm starting with him is, like I said, I started with the Council of Nicaea and I'm going to work my way backwards. Now, I could just start with the Bible because the Bible was written before <laughs> the Bible was written in, you know, all the way before the year 100. But a lot of people don't believe that. Um, they have these other weird beliefs about the letter J, which I dealt with in the video, or they did, they have these beliefs about the Council of Nicaea making up the Bible. And uh, it, I think it will be a better practice to show you just how far back, um, just how far back, what we have today in terms of the Bible, um, how consistent it is over time and how far back we can push uh, the creation of Christianity and um, the worship of Jesus. So again, I started with the Council of Nicaea and we're gonna look at this author Lacantius and who he is is, as you can see here, his name is Lacantius, his name is Lucius Lacantius he lived between the years of 250 and, three, and 325, and he was an early Christian author. Now, I'm not going to read all this, and you can look at the Encyclopedia Britannica. 
You can look at church history websites. You can look anywhere and you're going to find the same information about him. And, and I say that because I know some people have an issue with uh, Wikipedia. But this is just what I'm starting out with. You can feel free to check on other sites uh, on who this man is. And one thing I want to point out is that he is actually a Berber. He's in he's a North African Berber. Now, if you don't know what a Berber is, a Berber is a member of an indigenous people of North Africa. The majority of Berbers are settled farmers or now migrant workers. Again, you can, this is from dictionary. This is from the, the, the dictionary. You can look anywhere for that. I'm not trying to trick you or anything. But Lacantius is an African Christian, which is important because people tend to come up with this weird idea that Christianity is the white man's religion and Christianity, you know, wasn't introduced to Africans until slavery and all this other weird stuff. But he lived between 250 and 325, and he's an, a native African who was a Christian. So, you know, he's a Berber. He's a Northern African. Now, we're going to go to this website here. This website is called newadvent.org. Now, I believe this is a Catholic website, just from looking at some of the stuff that they have on their homepage. But uh, they keep a record of different documents from church fathers over, over time. It's a, you know, like historical record. Um, again, the, the name of the author is Lucius Lacantius. The name of the work we're going to be looking at is called of the manner in which the pers persecutors died. Now, again, if you don't feel comfortable with this website, you don't trust it. You can look for this anywhere because this isn't a secret. The, the documents, none of the documents we look, we're going to look at is secret, hidden by the church or anything like that. People that study church history know these things. Um, we're not going to read this whole thing because this is a humongous document. But to give you a little context, the purpose of this document is that this Christian writer, and I'll see if I can find it in here somewhere. But this Christian writer is writing this document and he's documenting the death of of all of the leaders who persecuted Christianity. And one of the things he's going to try to prove is, um, just to read this one thing right here, for God delayed to punish them that by great and marvelous examples, he might teach posterity that he alone is God and that with fit vengeance, he executes judgment on the proud the impious and the persecutors. So this guy, he believes in God and he believes he's looking at history and he's saying God has systematically humbled these various leaders who went out of their way to persecute Christians and to persecute God. Now, we're going to skip down to chapter 11 for the sake of time. And Galerius is the main person I wanted to speak about with this video. So I'm going to start reading right here in chapter 11. The mother of Galerius, a woman exceedingly superstitious. Now, by the way, before I continue, um, again, the question here is, th does this description of Christianity and their treatment, does it lend better to an understanding that these are people that are worshiping a Greek god that was designed to bring people into the Roman kingdom? Or it does this fit a description of people that are worshiping a non-Greek God or non-Roman God, something totally different from what the Romans actually liked? All right. The, the mother of Galerius, a woman exceedingly superstitious, was a votary of the gods of the mountains. Being such a character, she made sacrifices almost every day. And she feasted her servants on the meat offered to items, idols. But the Christians of her family would not partake of those entertainments. And while she feasted with the Gentiles, they continued in fasting and prayer. So right here you see the, the Christians would not partake in the sacrifices to the Roman gods. Does that sound like a, a G, the followers of Jesus or followers of Serapis? Because Serapis was a Greek god, which Greek slash Roman god, I should say. On this account, she conceived ill will against the Christians and by woman-like complaints instigated her son, 
no less superstitious than herself, to destroy them. So during the whole winter, Diocletian and Galerius, now these are going to, these are important. These are two Roman rulers. Diocle, these are Diocletian and Galerius held councils together at which no one else assisted. And it was the universal opinion that their conferences respected the most momentous affairs of the empire. The old man long opposed the fury of Galerius and showed how Copernicus it would be to raise disturbances throughout the world and to shed so much blood that the Christians were wont with eagerness to meet death and that it would be enough for him to exclude persons of that religion from the court and from the army. So I'm not exactly sure which one they're saying in terms of who's the old man. Um, maybe they're talking about Diocletian, but that doesn't make sense as we'll see as we read on. But basically, someone is saying, um, I, I'm guessing this is Diocletian, which is weird. But it says this old man long opposed the fury of Galerius. And it's, he's saying there's no point in killing them all. Just kick them out the army. It's just kick them out of the court and kick them out of the army. Yet he could not restrain the madness of that obstinate man. He, he resolved, therefore, to take the opinion of his friends. Now, this was a circumstance in the bad disposition of Diocletian that whenever he determined to do good, he did it without advice, that the praise might be all his own. But whenever he determined to do ill, which he was, sens when he, which he was sensible would be blamed, he called in many advisors that his own fault might be imputed to other men. And therefore a few civil magistrates and a few military commanders were admitted to give their counsel. And the question was put to them according to priority of rank. Some through personal ill will towards the Christians were of the opinion that they ought to be cut off as enemies of the gods and adversaries of the established religious ceremonies. Again, this is a very important thing right here. So some of the counselors who came in had ill will against the Christians because it says that they, they should be cut off as enemies of the gods and adversaries of the established religious ceremonies. Does this sound like people that worship Jesus a non-Roman god, or does this sound like people that worship Serapis, who's a Greek slash Roman god? Others thought differently, but having understood the will of Galerius, they either through dread of displeasing or from a desire of gratifying him, concurred in the opinion given by given against the Christians. Yet not even then could the emperor be prevailed upon to yield his assent. This guy was so evil. He determined above all to consult his gods. And to that end, he dispatched a soothsayer to inquire of Apollos and Miletus, whose answer was such might be expected from an enemy of the divine religion. So this guy, um, Lacantius, is saying, well, Apollo is not the God. He's not the, the, the he's not the God of the divine religion, Christianity. So, of course, Apollo's priest or soothsayer is going to say something evil against it. So Diocletian was, was drawn over from his purpose, but although he could struggle no longer against his friends and against Caesar and Apollo, yet he yet still he attempted to observe such moderate moderation as to command the business to be carried through without bloodshed. Whereas Galerius would have had all persons burnt alive who refused to sacrifice. So again, it makes sense that, okay, so Diocletian was resisting against Galerius saying, just kick him out the court and out the army. That's enough penalty. But Galerius was deadly intent on harming these Christians. And it says Galerius would have had all persons burnt alive who refused to sacrifice. Now, this is talking in context to Christians, which means that the Christians, as it says earlier in this, they didn't want to sacrifice to the Roman gods. Again, Jesus or Serapis. Who does it sound like these people actually worship? Jesus or Serapis without even mentioning the, the name of who they worship, you can just tell by what they don't do that they're not just following the Greek and Roman status quo. Let's read chapters 12 and 13, and then we're going to skip to the death of Galerius. A fit and auspicious day was sought out for the accomplishment of this undertaking, meaning the burning alive of everyone who refused to sacrifice. And the festival of the god Terminus celebrated on the 7th of the Kalends of March, was chosen in preference to all others to terminate, as it were, the Christian religion. So again, 
why would if if they if these Christians were just worshiping the Roman god Serapis, why would the people be trying to snuff them out? That day, the harbinger of death arose, first cause of ill and long enduring woes. It looks like this is a quote here that's missing, like a, a poetic quote that's missing some here. Of woes which befell not only the Christians, but the whole earth. When that day dawned in the eighth consulship of Diocletian and the seventh of Maxium, suddenly, while it was hardly light, the prefect, together with chief commanders, tribunes, and officers of the treasury, came to the church in Nicodemia, and the gates, having been forced open, they searched everywhere for an image of the divinity. So they've come to a church to attack the Christians, um, and they're looking for an image of the divinity. Now, as you read it, you'll notice they won't find an image of the God, which, again, does this sound like Christians? Or does it sound like uh, people, the Roman people worshiping the Roman God? Because Christians, you know, the Bible says not to make graven images of your God. So Christians won't have one. That's why you won't see statues of Jesus. You won't see pictures of Jesus and paintings of Jesus until like the 200s and 300s. Because that was foreign to the Christian religion. Once Christianity started spreading through the Roman Empire, the people who came from a culture where they had statues of gods, they started to make images of Jesus. But that was a very foreign thing in the beginning of Christianity. So where am I at? So the books of the Holy Scriptures were found and they were committed to the flames. So the Christians had scriptures back then. Keep this in mind because this is this is in the uh, this is in the mid two hundreds to the to late two hundreds before the Council of Nicaea in three twenty five, and they had scriptures. So this idea that the Christians created scriptures or or, or pick, pick books of the Bible at the Council of Nicaea is just ridiculous. Uh, where am I at? The scriptures were found and they were committed to the flames. The utensils and the furniture of the church were ab- abandoned to pillage. All was rapine, confusion, and tumult. That church, situated on rising ground, was within view of the palace, and Diocletian and Galerius stood, as if on a watchtower, disputing long whether it ought to be set on fire. The sentiment of Diocletian prevailed, who dreaded lest, so great a fire once being kindled, some part of the city might he burnt, for there were many and large buildings that surrounded the church. Then the Praetorian guards came in battle array with axes and other iron instruments and having been set loose everywhere, they in a few hours leveled that very lofty edifice to the ground. So they burnt, they went to the Christian church seeking the the Christian God, the, the statue or image or whatever, so they can destroy it. And they burnt the scriptures, they tore down the building. And let's go to chapter 13. Next, next day, an edict was published. What an edict was published, depriving the Christians of all honors and dignities, ordaining also that, without any distinction of rank or degree, they should be subjected to tortures, and that every suit at law should be received against them. While on the other hand, they were debarred from being plaintiffs. While, in questions of wrong, adultery, or theft, and finally, that they should neither be capable of freedom or having the right of suffrage. So basically, they literally made an edict saying, we're going to just stack the courts against these Christians to make them suffer. Mm. A certain person tore down this edict and cut it into pieces, improperly indeed, but with high spirit, saying in scorn, these are the triumphs of Goths and Samaritans. Having been instantly seized and brought to judgment, he was not only tortured, but burnt alive in the forms of law. And having displayed admirable patience under sufferings, he was consumed in ashes. So they made this clearly biased decree against the Christians. Someone got mad, they tore it up, and then they ended up dying for it. All right, now we're going to skip ahead to chapter 33, and I'm just going to read just this here, because this is is where Galerius meets his end. 
Now, and now, when Galerius was in the 18th year of his reign. Now, again, Galerius is the ruler who's like the most determined to punish Christians and make them suffer. God struck him with an incurable plague, and malignant ulcer form, formed itself low down in his secret parts and spread by degrees. We're going to script. We're going to skip down to here. So the people were trying to heal him of this disease. It says they applied warm flesh of animals to the chief seed of the disease, that the warmth might draw out those minute worms. And accordingly, when the dressings were were removed, there issued forth an innumerable swarm. Nevertheless, the prolific disease had hatched swarms much more abundant to prey upon and consume his intestines. Already, through a complication of distempers, the different parts of his body had lost their natural form. The superior parts were dry and meager and haggard, and his ghastly-looking skin had settled itself deep among his bones, while the inferior dis distended like bladders retained no appearance of joints. These things happened in the course of a complete year. And at length, overcome by calamities, he was obliged to acknowledge God, and he cried aloud in the intervals of raging pain that he would re-edify the church which he had demolished and make atonement for his misdeeds. And when he was near his end, he published an edict of the tenor following. So, Galerius, who's doing all these evil things to Christians, he's got this terrible disease and he's dying. And basically on his deathbed, He's going to try to he's going to try to repent and and uh, gain favor from God so that he can live so that God can heal him. Um, so that's that's what all that was about. Now, chapter 34 is going to be the, the, the decree that he gave, which will be called the Edict of Milan. So here we go right here. This is the decree that he sent forth. Amongst our other revelations, regulations for the permanent advantage of the commonwealth, we have hitherto studied to reduce, reduce all things to a conformity with the ancient laws and the public discipline of the Romans. Let me make sure I'm recording. All right, here we go. The Romans, where am I at? Oh, it has been our aim in a special manner that the Christians also who had abandoned the religions of their forefathers should return to right opinions for such willful and folly had we know not how taken possession of them that instead of observing those ancient institutions which possibly their own forefathers had established they through caprice made laws to themselves and drew together in different societies many men of widely different persuasions so what this is saying right here, is, it's saying that we're also saying that the Christians should return to their original religion. And it says right here, it says, it says, because for, for, for reasons that we don't know, they stopped following the religion of their forefathers. And they started bringing in people who weren't of their own, basically saying that their religion wasn't what it used to be. Then this is obviously interesting coming from the person who was having them killed. Of course, they wouldn't practice their religion. But Jesus or Serapis, does this sound like someone who's, does this sound like the Christians were worshiping a Roman God? Or does this sound like a group of people who are worshiping a God, something completely foreign to what the Romans were used to? I mean, he says right here that he mentioned the ancient institutions, which were uh, established by their own forefathers, meaning they had their, their entirely own different thing. After the publication of our edict, ordaining the Christians to betake themselves to the observance of the ancient institutions, many of them were subdued through the fear of danger, and moreover, many of them were exposed to jeopardy. Nevertheless, because great numbers still persist in their opinions, and because we have perceived that at present they neither pay reverence and due to the gods, nor yet worship their own God. Now, uh, here we go again. It says that they neither pay reverence and adoration to the gods, nor worship their own God. Does this sound like Christ Jesus or Serapis? 
because they don't acknowledge the Roman. It says right here that they don't acknowledge the Roman gods. And this is coming from a man who used to persecute them. Therefore, we, from our own wanted clemency and bestowing pardon on all, have judged it fit to extend our indulgences to those men and to permit them again to be Christians and to establish the places of their religious assemblies, yet so as they offend not against good order. Another By another mandate, we purpose to signify unto magistrates how they ought herein to demean themselves. While it will be the duty of the Christians, in consequence of our toleration, to pray to their God for our welfare and for that of the public and for their own, and that the common will, commonwealth, I guess, may continue safe in every quarter, and that may the, they themselves may live securely in their habitations. So he's kind of ordering the Christians to pray for their pray for the Roman Empire. But again, it says again, like they're to pray to their God. So is this Jesus or Serapis? All right, we're nearing the end here. Make sure I'm we're going to read chapter 34 and 35. I'm sorry, 35 and 36, and that's going to be it. So Galerius, he made this edict on his deathbed that Christians should go back to their own religion and they should pray to their own God for the health of the uh, Roman Empire. Chapter 35. This edict was promulgated at Nicodemia on the day preceding the Calends of May in the 8th consulship of Galerius and the 2nd of Maximum Dia. Then the prison gates having been thrown open, you, my best beloved Donatus, together with other confessors of the faith, were set at liberty from jail. So, uh, uh, what's his name again? Lanctius, Lacantius. He's actually writing this to his friend Donatus, who was actually one of the people that were locked up in jail. So it says, you, my beloved Donatus, together with the other confessors of the faith, were set at liberty from jail, which has been your residence for six years. Galerius, however, did not, by publication of this edict, obtained the divine forgiveness. In a few days after he was consumed by in a, in a few days after he was consumed by the horrible disease that had brought on a universal future for Crason. Dying, he recommended his wife and his son to Licinius, who's another leader. He's one of, another one of the, the rulers, and delivered them over into his hands. This event was known at Nicodemia before the end of the month. His Vicennial anniversary was to have been celebrated on the ensuing Calends of March. So he was reaching like his one of his anniversaries of being a ruler. And he died. Now, this is the main part that I wanted to read here. I gave you all of that for context and to, you know, gave you several opportunities to examine whether this group of people, these Christians, sound like people that are worshiping a Roman God or a foreign God. All right. Chapter 36. Dia, who is Maximus, Dia, on receiving this news, hastened with relays of horses from the east to seize the dominions of Galerius, and while Licinius lingered in Europe, to, to arrogate himself all the country as far as the narrow seas of Chalcedon. So basically, as soon as Maximus or Dia, as soon as he heard that uh, Galerius had died, he, he swooped in to take over his land. On his entry into Bithynia, he, with the view of acquiring immediate popularity, abolished Galerius's tax to the great joy of all. So Galerius had, Galerius had this oppressive tax that he imposed on the people. So Maximus came and abolished it. Dissension arose between the two emperors, meaning Licinius and Dia, and almost in open war. They stood on the opposite shores with their armies. Peace, however, and amity were established under certain conditions. Licinius and Dia met on the narrow seas, concluded a treaty, and in token of friendship joined hands. Then Dia, believing all things to be in security, returned to Nicodemia and was in his new dominions what he had been in Syria and Egypt. First of all, he took away the toleration and general protection granted by Galerius to the Christians. And for this end, he secretly procured addresses from different cities requesting that no Christian church might be built within their walls. 
And thus he meant to make that which was his own choice appear as if extorted from him by importunity. So this guy is one of the first things he did was make sure that Christians couldn't uh, build churches. But he spread it around. He, the way he issued it was to make it seem like someone else forced him to make that decree, not that he was making that decree on his on his own. In compliance with those addresses, he introduced a new mode of gov government and things respecting religion. And for each city, he created a high priest chosen from among the persons of most distinction. The office of those men was to make daily sacrifices to all their gods. And with the aid of the former priests to prevent Christians from erecting churches or worshiping God. Now, Lacantius is a Christian. So when he's mentioning God singular like this, he's talking about the Christian God. Or from worshiping God, either publicly or in private. And he authorized them to compel the Christians to sacrifice to idols. And on their refusal to bring them before the civil magistrate and as if this had not been enough, in every province, he, he established a superintendent priest, one of the chief eminence in the state, and he commanded that all those priests newly instituted should appear in white habits. The, where is it? Oh. That being the most honorable distinction of dress. So I'm going to stop right here again. So he instituted his own state religion and... He tried to force the Christians to worship to idols. If these were worshipers of Serapis, if these Christians were worshiping pagan gods, why would they have to be forced to worship pagan gods? But if they worship the, the, the God of Judaism, if they worship the God of Christianity, who said, don't bow down to no other gods, there's only one God, have no graven images before you, then to me, this is cut and clear. And as to the Christians, he proposed the following course that he had followed in the East. And affecting the show of clemency, he forbade the slaying of God's servants, but he gave command that they should be mutilated. So the confessors for the faith had their ears and nostrils slit, their hands and feet lopped off, and their eyes dug out their sockets. So this guy did terrible, terrible things to those Christians. And, and I'm going to end here. I can go for this document goes on. This is an interesting document to read regarding, you know, church history and some Roman history. And it goes on to talk about Constantine, which some of y'all might find interesting. But I bring this, I mention this document just, just to point out that this document that was written, where is it at? This document was written uh, between the mid 200s AD to the late 200s AD, um, it, it gives you a description of the Christians before the Council of Nicaea. And numerous times you see that the Christians were people that didn't worship the Roman slash Greek gods. They had their own gods and they seemed to have their own separate religion and they were getting attacked for that. So I'm just going to ask you, does this sound like they're worshiping their Greek Roman god Serapis or they're worshiping Jesus? Or at the very least, not necessarily Jesus, but something other than a Greek Roman God. And with that, I'm going to wrap this video up. Uh, the next video or the next document that I'm going to be looking at, the next document that I'm going to be looking at is the Edict of Milan. That is That will be an agreement between Licinius and Constantine, who will, uh, who will roll back this persecution again. The same way that Galerius tried to do, they're going to roll back this persecution, but this time it's going to actually stick.